Hello and welcome back to English 332. This covers chapter 19 of the book, Making Oral Presentations. And I know a lot of you probably agree with Seinfeld, who said something like uh, he'd rather be the one, or most people would rather be the one in the casket than the one giving the eulogy at a funeral. People just, uh, some people anyway, are really nervous about speaking in public. They don't like the idea of public speaking or even uh, speaking to small groups of coworkers. They get really nervous, really anxious, uh, or they just feel like, uh, you know, it's not for them or they don't know how to give an effective presentation. So uh, hopefully by the end of this, uh, this presentation, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with the topic, uh, learn how to enjoy uh, giving presentations or at least not look upon it as something to be anxious or uh, a big pain, uh, but something that could really advance your career and you get a lot of satisfaction from. So we've got a lot to cover. So without further ado, uh, let's get into the topic. All right, so here go our learning objectives for this presentation. We'll be talking about the purpose, the different purposes you might give a presentation, some strategies for composing them, uh, how to organize them effectively, where to uh, put visuals, where to find them, how to actually give your presentation or deliver it, We'll talk about how to handle questions that you might get during the presentation. And so six great learning objectives. Now, what about the purposes in an oral presentation? Or why would you be giving an oral presentation in some type of business context? And the book gives us three main uh, purposes. Uh, so the one is to inform now, like this lecture here, I'm just teaching you about oral presentations. It's informative. Uh, the second type is persuasive, and that is to uh, motivate you to do something or to believe something. So think about a political presentation or a sales presentation. You want somebody to buy your, your product or hire your team. That'd be persuasive. Or the uh, proposals, you want the publisher to uh, be motivated to publish your book, right? So you're, you've got a persuasive that's your main uh, purpose. And then lastly, goodwill, uh, which could be entertainment value. <laughs> they say, and validate the audience. Uh, this goodwill one here is kind of the, the catch all, I guess. Uh, you know, if you're not persuading, you're not informing somebody, why are you giving the presentation? It must be either to entertain people or, or just to reassure them somehow, I suppose. Uh, but the first two are the main areas. And the book also talks about how most presentations will be some combination of these. And so don't think about it as you're informing somebody or you're persuading them or uh, you're expressing goodwill towards them. Uh, rather see uh, most presentations will be some combination of these with one, one of the purposes standing out. So for example, your book proposal um, presentation, you're persuading the publisher to publish the book, but you're also of course informing them and you're also showing that you're somebody that can be trusted, that you have the publisher's best interest at heart. And the book tells you to make the purpose as specific as possible. Well, this is just true of most business communication. Uh, with those cover letters to the resume, for example, we talked about how you need to be really clear in that first line about why are you writing? Uh, what, what is the, or an email? Uh, why are you sending this email? Uh, that needs to be clear. If uh, people are watching a presentation and it's good, you're a good five, 10 minutes into it and they still don't know like, what is this about or, or why am I here? Why is this person giving a presentation? You know, that's a bad sign. And they also emphasize how the, your purpose is not the same as the introduction. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they emphasize this so much here in this, uh, <laughs> this PowerPoint, but. I guess you just don't want to get confused. We're not talking about the uh, the hook or that uh, opening of the PowerPoint or your presentation, but just the sort of general purpose as to why you're writing it. All right, so here's how to plan your presentation strategy. Now, the general strategy is to uh, think about a very specific goal and a specific audience. So we just covered a few, like the information. So let's say you have an informative presentation. So you want to decide, uh, well, what are the goals specifically? Like, why do I want to inform the audience about? What's the most important things I need to get across? 
and also thinking about a particular audience. So I think about this all the time as a professor. I think about, well, what about the class? What, what level are the, are the students at? Is this a freshman class? Is it a, is it a senior group of seniors, graduate students? Uh, or even within that group, once you get to, once I get to know once I get to know the students, I might uh, decide to put in more introductory introductory stuff, more background information. And so I'm always thinking about that audience, and you should do the same thing uh, when you give your presentations. Uh, another key idea is to simplify, <laughs> simplify, simplify. I see I go to conferences all the time, and I see people breaking this rule, and they're up there with this very complicated presentation and they're just reading from a paper and there's no way the audience can really follow that. It, it's hard to, to just listen uh, to text being read and comprehend everything that's being said. You need more time with it, you need to read it, you need to parse it and it's kind of impossible in an oral presentation, right? Uh, so the key is to just to make it simple, don't try, don't, don't feel like you have to get everything across uh, this in a 20 page document. Uh, if you get three or four points across, uh, that's probably a good uh, target to shoot for. And same thing with visuals. Uh, you don't want really complicated graphs. Uh, for one, they probably won't even be able to see it in the, in the back. Um, uh, but also, it kind of defeats the purpose after a while. Instead of a visual aid, it just becomes a visual distraction. Make simpler than written message to the same audience. So, very good advice. I had a professor that he made a point of, uh, he's talking about giving papers at conferences, and he said he wanted he wanted us to uh, write out our script, uh, but at the same time, he wanted it to be a simplified script. So he said, try to make your uh, script more like the way you talk, basically. So simplify it, cut it back. If it's a 10-page document, uh, you want that oral, uh, the oral one will need probably need to be about half that because it takes you longer to read out loud than it does to... Uh, uh, read silently and also again that audience they're having to try to remember what it is you're saying to uh, follow along with you and, and that's harder to do in an oral situation than uh, when they're just sitting down uh, quietly reading uh, so that's something else to keep in mind but <laughs> uh, you probably see the main idea here is just to keep it simple uh, don't overcomplicate things don't make too many visuals too many words uh, don't try to be too uh, complex. And these are the different kinds of presentations you might give. And you've probably seen most of these at some point in school, or if you go to business meetings of any kind, you've probably seen these, or uh, even church services, uh, sermons, you could think about in this first category is, is a monologue. So the presenter speaks without interruption, and there's questions somewhere at the end. This is usually what you see in an academic conference. Uh, there's also the guided discussions. So this time the speaker is, is really being more interactive. The audience is being asked uh, to do a lot more stuff. They might do a lot more uh, questions and answers throughout. Uh, maybe the uh, audiences are the ones proposing topics. And the presenter there is kind of more of a facilitator, they call it. So again, it's not in this model, you're probably not even doing most of the talking. Uh, instead, you're leading the discussion. And then the last uh, type they give here is interactive. And they say, this is just a conversation uh, like a sales presentation. Uh, so I guess this is somewhere in between those first two. All right, and this is probably the, the golden rule here of public speaking uh, or writing for that matter is really tailoring your message, your message to your audience. And you see politicians get into trouble sometimes with this, right? Because they'll say one thing to a group of investors or bankers or somebody like that. And then, but when they're speaking on the stump, giving their stump speech to more working class audience, they might say something completely different. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, instead, we're talking about thinking about that audience, what they're likely to understand, what, what they need to hear. Uh, Everything from word choices to the style, the tone, all of that stuff, but hopefully not the facts. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, so the first piece of advice they have here is don't seek major opinion change in one presentation. Uh, so you see this all the time. People think that if you're good, good at persuasion, then you should be able to give that one speech or that. You watch that one television commercial, 
and that's going to change your, your mind, right? It doesn't really work like that. Uh, instead, a lot of uh, persuasion is very subtle, very cumulative process. You're kind of planting little seeds, and maybe the seed will grow in, into something that might change your opinion, uh, or maybe not. That's not really the goal. We're not talking about some kind of magical formula here that you could just use and instantly persuade somebody to your point of view. A uh, second advice, a second piece of advice here is to make the ideas relevant to the audience uh, by li uh, linking what you say to their interests. So again, in teaching, you do this all the time, right? You try to come up with examples that the students will be familiar with, stuff from uh, the shows they're watching or the music they're listening to, uh, or you think about what they might want to do for a job, a career, and you stress how what we're saying is going to be relevant to that uh, career. It's in their best interest to listen and apply what you're teaching them. Just like with this uh, speech we're giving now about oral presentations, I started off by saying it's something that will uh, more than likely give you a boost to your career. Uh, showing the audience that the topic affects them directly, it's very, it always gets your attention, right, when you hear that, um, you know, that there's some new development and it's going to apply to you. If I said, uh, listen to what I have to say, uh, uh, the tu your tuition is about to go up. <laughs> <laughs> you'd probably perk up and say, well, well, I need to listen to this because that affects me directly. Now, that's a lot more effective than if I just started off talking about oh, school fees or uh, costs of education and it wasn't clear to you how that pertained to you. Only later you might figure out how it pertains to you. It's more effective if you know that immediately. All right, choosing the information to go into the presentation. You know, most of the time in a presentation, you'll have a limited time, right? You might have 15 minutes, you might have an hour. Uh, sometimes there's whole uh, days, day-long workshops. So you, <laughs> uh, depending on how much time you've got, uh, that will largely determine this. But in any case, you want to think about what would be the most interesting and the most persuasive bits and anything that's kind of far, far down the list. Uh, you might want to omit that uh, if time is pressing. Uh, plan to answer the audience's questions and objections. So you never really know what you might get asked or what people might object to. But if you're smart, you can go through your, your speech and think about, well, what might this audience find objectionable? Or what's some questions they, they might have? And uh, one strategy I've heard about is uh, people will int intentionally leave out uh, some information from their uh, presentation, knowing that that's a good knowing that uh, it's a good chance that somebody will ask about that and they can prepare a really good answer to that question. Now, I don't know, I think that's a little bit devious, <laughs> uh, but it certainly doesn't hurt to look over it yourself or uh, have a friend look over it and say, well, what, some question, what are some questions you might have about this? Or do you find any of this objectionable? And again, thinking about that audience, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk now about uh, guns, gun legislation and uh, so what is it, the Second, Amend Second Amendment and all this stuff. Uh, so if you're going to give, if you were a politician uh, about to give a speech about gun control, let's say, and you knew the audience was uh, NRA members, well, they'd probably have a lot different questions and objections than this other group that might be, uh, let's say, teachers or uh, parents or some other group. Uh, limit it to three main points. Again, really good advice. Uh, one of the problems I see with most PowerPoints is they, even uh, with the ones I've been using uh, from this book, is they tend to overload the slides. You, know, you might see five points on there. It's just a lot of information to take in. P people don't want to get be stuck on a slide for that long. And again, coming back to this idea of just keep it simple. People won't be able to follow all the nuances uh, that they would in a written document. So just three is a pretty good number to stick to. And keep in mind, too, you can always put in more slides. Uh, showing relationships between the main points. Uh, I know this is important, too, for written communication, but uh, don't ever assume that the audience will be able to follow your line of thought or make all the same uh, leaps or connections between the ideas that you will. Now remember, you know the material, you know the content, you know how it all fits together. They might not. And sometimes they might be able to figure it out, but <laughs> if you can show it to them, uh, that's almost always better. 
Uh, and then linking the points to the audience's knowledge. Uh, again, come back to uh, the teaching situations. All right? if, I, if I know that you are a senior, then I assume you know a lot more about business communication or writing or college, and whatever your major is, uh, than somebody that's brand new, you know, a freshman, right? Uh, but in any case, I need to think about what do you know, and when I have something new I want to introduce, I want to find a way to connect it uh, to that. So, for example, here in a minute we'll be talking about uh, Prezi. Uh, Prezi's, uh, it, it, not many people are familiar with that. Not many people have even heard of it, much less used it. Uh, but if I tell you that it's a lot like PowerPoint, or it's, it's software to give presentations like PowerPoint, well, you know what PowerPoint is. So I'm sort of linking this new information to what you probably already know. Okay, now we're moving into organizing a presentation. And some of this stuff you've probably heard before. Uh, the, the strong opening, <laughs> you might think of this as a, sort of the first impression, right? Uh, and sometimes I notice when people give presentations, especially uh, if they're amateurs or students, uh, or sometimes you even see this at academic conferences, uh, they, they start off really kind of weak, uh, right? They they kind of they're kind of fumbling around a little bit with their notes. Uh, they're having they're trying to load in their PowerPoint. That's taking a while. Uh, they forget to introduce themselves. <laughs> it's just all kinds of uh, little ways you can go go off with that. Uh, whereas somebody that's really well planned, they get that uh, you, know, you get that ball rolling right off the top, and that really will guide the whole rest of the presentation. It makes it a lot easier <laughs> if you, you can start off strong. Uh, so that's something to really think about. And uh, the same thing with the conclusion, right? Because this is what people will walk away uh, thinking about is whatever you were talking about the, at the end of that presentation. And so just be careful. I know sometimes you're giving a presentation and you might start off strong, but as you're going along there, you lose energy and the conclusion ends up really weak. <laughs> uh, so you just want to not do that and think instead about starting with a bang and then ending uh, with an even bigger bang. Uh, I usually use the comparison of a, a fireworks show. So if you go to a, if you go to watch the fireworks on the 4th of July here in, in uh, at Hester Park in St. Cloud, uh, think about the way they do those fireworks. Usually the first, you know, you, first couple of uh, fireworks are boom, boom, gets everybody's attention. Uh, and they might do that for a little while, but then they'll sort of gradually peter off so that, you know, there's a few minutes where there's just one pow, and then maybe a couple pow, pow. <laughs> uh, they sort of do that for a while, variations on that. Uh, but then at the end, that's when they really bring out all of the, all the stops, right? So you have this, this enormous, huge boom, 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 boom <laughs> at the end, and everybody goes home really happy and, and thrilled. Uh, so you could think about this as you're giving your presentation. You could, you could imagine that your, your points, uh, whatever the points, the information you're trying to get across, uh, that's kind of like these uh, rockets that you have as, in your fireworks show. Uh, so you want a couple of big ones to start off with, uh, and then you want to kind of keep it moderate throughout the, the middle, and then save uh, something for that big, strong conclusion uh, so everybody will come away from your presentation with you got their money's worth. Okay, so how do you plan uh, for a strong opening? What does it actually mean? Um, uh, the first couple here have to do with emphasis. So you want to really take advantage of that introduction. Remember, this is where people are deciding. You know, is this are they going to stick around and listen to what you have to say? Are they going to, to tune out? What, what what is the point of all this? Uh, so you want to try to get them interested, uh, but you also want to emphasize the key points that will actually be uh, in your presentation. And they tell you here to memorize the opener and closer. Now often uh, when you see a presentation and somebody just pulls up some notes and they start reading from the notes, they don't even look up, uh, that's pretty weak. It's not a really good position of emphasis there. Uh, people might even start to drift off immediately. Uh, so even if you are going to uh, be reading from notes, it's not that hard to just memorize uh, the very first couple of lines. And then again, the last few things you want to say so you can look up from the notes, make eye contact, really emphasize those points. And then we're going to have some uh, have some opening ideas, I guess, some, some basic guidelines. Uh, one is the uh, the startling statement. 
Uh, so you could think about presentations you've heard where uh, they might say, did you, did you know that every hour, every hour there's 12 people that <laughs> eat a brownie? <laughs> and it's making something up, I don't know. Uh, you could have uh, some stats related to your project or, or like the with a book proposal, let's say you wanted to write yours about golfing in St. Cloud, right? So you could say something like, uh, did you know that the golfing industry here in St. Cloud is a $2 million a year industry? Whoa, you know, nobody knew that. <laughs> it kind of gets their attention, right? Or uh, did you know that 100,000 uh, people are in the golf course? You know, you get the idea, right? So uh, something that gets their attention, uh, the narr that's the startling statement. Uh, the second possibility is, is a, they say narration or anecdote, basically a little story. Uh, so if I wanted to talk about oral presentations, for example, I might open by saying, uh, I might start talking about my uh, first time I had to give a, a lecture, right? And I talk about how nervous I was and, and all this kind of stuff. That's a way to kind of get you to relate to me as a person. And people like to hear about other people uh, more than just boring facts. Or again, with a book proposal, uh, you could talk about what got you interested in uh, writing a book like that, right? Or your first time golfing and how great it was. Uh, questions, another very common way to start off. You could say, how many people in the room have uh, played golf before? <laughs> or how many people love giving uh, oral presentations? And it's just a way to kind of get people moving. They realize that you're paying attention to them. Uh, they're having to... Uh, acknowledge you in some fashion, right? And that, that can kind of uh, liven things up. And then lastly, you could do like I did with this presentation where I talked about that Seinfeld quotation. <laughs> I kind of butchered a, a little bit, but that was the idea. Uh, some relevant quotation, and there's whole books you can buy. Uh, there's Bartlett's famous book of quotations, and you can uh, find uh, quotes related to every topic. I use a site called Brainy Quote. That's brainy, like your brain. And you could type in there, uh, give me a quotation about public speaking. And there'll be three or four, maybe sometimes dozens uh, for famous artists and politicians and writers and so on. And I'll find one that I like and you can open up with that. And you know, their they're, reason they're quotations is because they're well-worded and memorable. Uh, so that's a good way to open. All right, so on to the body of the uh, presentation. And we've got five different basic patterns here. And one is chronological. So this is just uh, past, present, and future, basically as a chrono means time, right? Uh, so this is probably not the best for most presentations, but if you wanted to talk maybe about a problem, uh, you could talk about the past or the history of that problem, what's currently happening and, and what you might like to see in the future. Uh, so that could work. Uh, problem causes solution, another uh, very typical format. So what what are the symptoms you're having? <laughs> What's the symptoms the company's having? And what causes them? Uh, what might be some remedies? Uh, let's see, number three is the pro and con. So you, I know you've seen this plenty of times. Somebody will write up on the board. Uh, let's all the reasons for doing this and all the reasons we can come up with against it. And of course, if you're giving the presentation, you know which side you're on. So <laughs> you make a point of uh, making one of those look better. Uh, just a simple one, two, three. You, you could say, I got five, I got five things I want to say about oral presentations, right? First, and this is nice because it gives you some idea of how many points will be raised and, and uh, whereabouts we are in the presentation. Because you could say, well, now we're on the third point. Uh, there's five total. So more than halfway done. That's always good. And let's see, excluding alternatives. So explain the symptoms, all the obvious solutions, why those won't work. And then somewhere at the end, you have your workable solution there. So. And then on to the conclusion. What can you do there? Uh, well, let's say restating your main point. Now, if, this, if you're given a pretty long presentation, people might not even remember exactly what it was about. Uh, hopefully that's not the case, but it never hurts just to come back to that main point, uh, reiterate it again. You notice they do that in these uh, PowerPoints. Uh, if, you, if you had some kind of opener, like that little anecdote or story, you can always come back to that. Uh, so in the 
you know, if we came, if, if we were doing the one where I was talking about the very first public speaking engagement I ever had, how nervous I was, uh, then I can, at the end, I might come back to a conference I gave recently, right, and how much more comfortable I felt and how much more uh, <laughs> smoothly it went, let's say. Uh, and with a vivid, positive picture, you know, think about a, a, those, uh, a television commercial you might see for some kind of medication, right? And somewhere in the middle there, they talk about all the unpleasant side effects you might encounter. Well, they don't end with that list of side effects and it might kill you. <laughs> uh, they end with uh, showing the, the person, oh, he's, look how happy he is. He's there with his daughter or granddaughter and he's a... Uh, or, uh, you know, she's out in the in the field with all the flowers before she's allergic to, but now she's having a great time. <laughs> uh, so that's a nice, pleasant image to end on. Uh, or telling the audience exactly what to do. Uh, so if you have discussed a problem, you know, maybe you spent the whole time talking about how if, if you vote for this, this one policy, or you vote for this one person, uh, they're going to do all this horrible stuff. It's going to be a huge problem. It's just going to create a huge mess. Uh, but all this can be avoided if you just go out and vote, <laughs> right? If you just buy this, choose this software instead of that software, you know, everything will go uh, smoothly. So, uh, or with the uh, the book publishers again, you know, what do you want them to do? You want them to publish your book. So, you know, please publish my, please choose my book to publish <laughs> next next quarter. <laughs> all right, what about the visuals? So we got some visuals. Uh, here, right? We've got the, uh, where's my pen? Uh, we've got the little snapshot there, you know, so let's see, let's think about the, the points they make here. Uh, help the audience remember your points. Uh, well, that's always, that's always a good point to consider of the visual. It's supposed to be a visual aid, right? It's kind of a mnemonic device, kind of helps to get attention onto the slide, get people's eyes looking up here. Uh, but hopefully it will help them remember your points and uh, not distract uh, from what you're saying. Uh, serve as an outline uh, for your talk. So that's basically what, what I'm doing here. I, I got these little points that are coming up and I use those to, to structure what it is I'm going to say. You know, that's kind of weird. I don't know why that one popped up there, but uh, <laughs> great. it came up last. That was kind of weird. Uh, create a professional image and a strong impact. Uh, so I would agree with this. If you look at this uh, photo here, it's it's a nice quality photo. Uh, everything is, is uh, composed well. I like the fact that she's kind of looking out at the audience almost. It kind of uh, catches your, your eye. Uh, it's, it's a nice looking image. You could imagine uh, if this were really pixelated or if it was blurry or something or it's just a kind of crude cartoon, it wouldn't have that kind of impact. But when it looks like it was professionally produced, it's a professional photo, it's got a nice border around it, uh, it makes a good impression. All right, so on to designing your PowerPoint slides. Uh, one thing to consider is that you should use a uh, consistent background. You don't want to have a yellow slide, a yellow background on one slide, a pink one on another one, a, some fireworks on another one. It just it starts to look uh, it's just sort of chaotic after a while, kind of messy, it's not very professional might look like you just copied and pasted a bunch of different PowerPoints together. Uh, so think about this textbook. They always have this sort of blue gradient in the background. They have the yellow uh, bold headings and the white text there. They have the uh, at signs there for bullets. It all kind of works. Kind of, It's good for branding too. Right? You, you know what you're looking at uh, when you see a PowerPoint once you get used to the uh, format. Uh, the font size should be big. If you the more stuff you try to put on a PowerPoint, the smaller the fonts will get. And eventually it gets to the point where people in the back won't be able to see it. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's just a classic fail, right? So it's better to have more slides and have bigger text on them than to have just a few slides and tiny little text people won't be able to read. Now they do get some basic guidelines here, uh, 44 to 50 points for the titles and so on. but Word will pretty much do this for you. I don't ever really mess with it. I just let a word decide that. Uh, one thing that I would say here is don't go beyond this uh, this this level here. So you see, you got the main uh, the main level there, and then they got some indents indentations. This is kind of like a, 
a sublevel. Now, if I tried to have points up underneath that one, you know, at that point, the text would probably be too small. Uh, so again, more slides are better. And then uh, using bullet point phrases, not sentences, on your slides. So again, you don't want to have paragraphs unless you are re unless you're an uh, example like I want you to pay very careful attention to this paragraph here. Look at exactly the way it's worded. Uh, unless you're doing something like that, uh, you just want to have these little bullet point phrases, maybe just a couple of words, you know, uh, just enough to kind of frame it, maybe to remind you <laughs> what you're supposed to say there, uh, or to be kind of a guide uh, for the audience. Now, they shouldn't just be reading all this. Now, this should just be little guide points, and they should be listening to you. A clear, concise language. Uh, again, if I tried to word all these in a very academic fashion, I mean, use a big font. Right? I could have said they <laughs> could have said something like, uh, "Apply a large, or apply a, a very uh, apply a large uh, typographic element." You know, if I said something like that, uh, it'd probably just go over your head. You wouldn't be able to uh, grasp it quickly enough. Uh, use a big font. You know exactly what that means. It's not fancy language, uh, but it is clear and it's, it's short. All right, a couple other points here, uh, three to five points per slide. We've uh, covered that one already. Um, customizing your slides. How can you do that? Well, one's a logo. Uh, I'll never forget one of the uh, the best PowerPoints I, I saw in, in this class. I had a they were writing a proposal about public transportation that uh, was the theme and taxis specifically. And the way they did this, they at the bottom of their of each slide they had a little taxi cab uh, that was branded, you know, with their pretend company, right? And as you went along the presentation, this little you know, the next slide, the cab would be over here. The next slide, the cab would be over there. <laughs> you know, by the time you got to the end, the cab was at the uh, end of the uh, the slide. And I thought that was really clever. Uh, not only was it a way to get the logo in there, uh, but it made it made sense, you know, with the topic. And even kind of uh, reinforced what it was they were saying. Now, <laughs> I don't know how, how you could top that, really. Uh, that was well done. Uh, photos, another uh, way to customize slides. Uh, charts. Animation uh, can be useful too. Uh, sometimes you you notice with these points, uh, they're not just coming on. As soon as I turn the slide, it's not like you see all this text. It comes in point by point. And that's uh, the custom animation doing that. Um, you could have transitions in between the slides too. Again, it's something that can make it a little bit more visually interesting, but again, very easy to overdo it. You know, if I had every point doing a little you know, whirly thing every time it was popping on, that would just get annoying. Uh, so just minimally using those is pretty effective, but uh, don't overdo it. Yeah, too much <laughs> distracts the audience. All right, so on to Prezi uh, then. Uh, so if, you, if you're not familiar with Prezi, it's basically a little bit more of a, I've, hear, I've heard people call it more of a, a visual uh, format. So instead of thinking in terms of hierarchies or bullet points, uh, you're thinking more about space. And so in the Prezi's, instead of moving through it slide by slide, it kind of moves uh, to different locations. It's almost like the Prezi's is this giant poster board, right? And you got your points all over the place. And as the person clicks, you might move here uh, or you might move over here to something. Uh, sometimes uh, they can control uh, where it goes around that poster board or zoom in, zoom out. Uh, so it's good for some kinds of presentations and, and bad for other ones. And so, for example, if it's something spatial that you wanted to talk about, like maybe you are an architect and you want to talk about your design for that, that building, it'd be pretty cool to have a Prezi for that, right? Because you could, you know, as you're talking about the uh, this part of the, uh, the building, you could be click, you know, zoom in on that. As you're talking about this other thing, you might uh, zoom over there to that. I have seen this used professionally. Um, one of my temp agency jobs they had it was for a sign making company. And so these were people that would come in. If you have a new uh, moving into a new uh, headquarters, new office, uh, let's say your legal team, and you want to have all you know the branding on the windows, the door, uh, all of this kind of stuff. You want to have this uh, basically a theme uh, for your uh, business. 
And so what these folks would do is they'd go to the business, take a bunch of pictures of, uh, you know, all the spots where they wanted to put their signs. And then they use a Photoshop uh, to impose those signs to kind of, you know, put them <laughs> uh, where they would go, I guess, in the building. And then they use Prezi to kind of step people through the building, uh, which is really interesting and, and neat. People like that. Uh, however, you can end up with this horrible uh, roller coaster like thing. Uh, if you're just zooming all the way, it kind of zooms in and zooms out. Gets pe people actually will throw up sometimes if you get carried away with it. Uh, so again, minimal use. I try to think it's probably not going to be good for every kind of presentation, uh, only for ones that involve some kind of spatial uh, considerations, right? All right, what about the actual delivery? Uh, they talk a lot in the book about fear. I know that's, that's something a lot of people uh, stress about, we'll talk more about. Uh, eye contact. So this is a, a key question with a presentation, right? Do you want to be looking at notes the whole time, not making eye contact? Probably not. Uh, do you want to be staring at, into this person's face the whole time? <laughs> no, that would be weird. Uh, you want to, uh, I think they give you about five seconds. So look over here for about five seconds. So look over here. And what I find is, especially when you're up in, a, in front of a group like this, uh, people won't really be able to tell if you're looking right at them or not. Uh, so if you just kind of look over here in this general vicinity, uh, they'll think you're looking at them or it's it's good enough. Uh, so I don't do the whole st staring at somebody. Uh, that just gets a little weird to me. Uh, but I do like to spread my, you know, some, sometimes I'm looking over here and sometimes I'm looking there and, and over here. And it just kind of lets people know that I, I'm aware of the, the entire room, not just the person in front. Uh, developing a good uh, speaking voice. Uh, I guess this goes along here with this idea of fear. Uh, the main thing that I advise, and I'm not a public speaking professor. I highly recommend, by the way, you take some classes in public speaking, learn from somebody who, who uh, studies this for a living. Uh, but just my advice is uh, to take your time, to slow down, uh, try to uh, take breaths. It's usually the problem with the presentation is somebody's nervous, uh, they're talking too quickly, and that will uh, basically impact everything else. Uh, so if you can relax a little bit at the beginning, uh, you will, a lot of this other stuff will fall into place. Uh, but specifically on this one about the speaking voice, uh, what I recommend that you do is record yourself. And I've done this many, many times. I'm even doing it now. Uh, so you record yourself talking, go back, listen to it, figure out what your uh, problems are. Are you saying, uh, too much? Are you saying like too much? Um, do you have a, a tendency to jump into a high, high pitch? Are you too quiet? Now, all of that stuff, it's kind of hard to tell just by yourself, but if you record yourself, uh, you'll pick up on it. And also, if you go to the right place, the writing center here on campus, uh, you can schedule a room uh, to give a PowerPoint in, and one of the one of the uh, tutors will come in, and they will listen to you and give you advice on this. And it's just very very effective, because uh, a lot of that stuff you just can't pick up on. Uh, standing and gesturing, uh, so you want to make uh, gestures like this guy's doing here. He's kind of pointing at his uh, his uh, what is that a whiteboard back there? It's kind of hard to see. Uh, but you see, you see he's standing. He's making that gesture. And now I've seen speakers before they'll be sitting down and they'll just be reading and they'll, they'll never even look up. It's pretty, pretty boring. Or they will have the PowerPoint going and they'll be hiding behind their podium somewhere. You can barely even see them. Uh, again, bad. Uh, better to stand. I always say, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're not excited enough to be standing give, during your presentation, uh, you're not excited enough. Right? You probably shouldn't be the one giving that presentation. I mean, if even you can't get excited about it, uh, good luck with the audience. Uh, so standing, making vivid gestures, uh, again, not getting carried away, not flapping like you're about to take off, uh, not uh, rocking back and forth or swaying around, uh, rocking on your feet, nothing like that. Uh, what you want to do is make gestures that will uh, reinforce your points. So like, again, this, this is a good example here with this guy. You can see he's gesturing towards his information back there. And that's effective at 
it lets people know what they should be looking at. Uh, sometimes I'll go so far, I haven't done this in a while, but uh, I would use a, a laser pointer or just a pointer, right? And you could, you know, if you're talking about here, looks like he's got ROI, return on investment, I believe that means. Uh, so you could have that laser pointer, you know, over here somewhere. So they really can focus in on that. And then when you want to talk about this other point, you move the pointer over. Uh, all of that stuff is great for uh, directing people's attention. Uh, now using notes and visuals, uh, he's got his whiteboard up there. Um, most likely you'd be using PowerPoint, uh, so you wouldn't have to worry so much about this, but it is a factor with the whiteboard situation. You do have to spend some time facing the board, writing on it. Uh, that can give people, a, people might tune out during that. Uh, same thing with notes. If you're obviously just reading from notes, uh, they can just, <laughs> people can get tired just looking at that huge pile of notes you got there. So uh, I highly recommend not going up there with a, a notebook uh, or a full size paper. Uh, use the note cards. I mean, that's the reason why they are sold, these little note cards. And don't write out everything on there, right? Just some, some memory tips, basically, of what points you want to cover. And I like the cards. You know, it's kind of old school technology, but I still will use these. And if it's a high stakes presentation, I'll just have a stack of cards. And what I like about them is uh, as you're going through these, you can be setting the ones you've talked about aside somewhere. And that gives people a visual cue as to how much longer your presentation is going to go, uh, which is always a nice thing for people to, to see. And also, they're not too big. It doesn't really cause a big distraction. People see you with a notebook in your hand. So it can be nice this way. Uh, I will add here, though, that if you have uh, Evernote, there's a bunch of tools like that for your iPhones, your Androids. Uh, it can really be the same thing. And you're just, instead of flipping physical cards, uh, you're just flipping like you would on a website. And it'll go to the next slide. Uh, that's useful. And also with PowerPoint, there is actually a notes tool that you can use in a presenter view. Uh, so if you can see the notes that you wrote to yourself on the monitor that you got over here that you're looking at, but it won't show up on the big screen for the audience. So that's that's nice too if you don't want to do the cards. But <laughs> you know, always say, uh, you know, if it's a big high stakes presentation and you're going to be talking to hundreds of people and it's, you know it's, it's, you're going to be nervous and anxious enough, last thing you want is to be taking big risks with technology breaking down on you. And so I always have these note cards. So just in case, you know, the computer doesn't work, file won't come up, uh, electricity goes off, I, I don't care. Anything could happen. Uh, I still got my notes. Now, I guess you could always lose your notes. <laughs> uh, but hopefully you can hold on to them. Oh, and uh, by the way, I should mention this while I'm thinking about it. Uh, number your notes. Uh, so if you got these note cards, put like one, two, three, four, five on it. I have seen people drop their notes. Uh, these note cards go everywhere, and then they uh, that's that causes them to panic, and it's hard to get the notes back together. Uh, but if you number them, uh, then you'll be able to quickly put them back, and people can even help you do this. Uh, so let's go back here for a minute with the fear. Uh, so what do you do if you're really afraid to talk? Uh, always think about that, well, a couple of things. One is that nobody wants to see you fail, right? Uh, don't assume that people uh, don't care about what you have to say or they uh, don't like you or whatever. You know, they're, they're, show, they're there for a reason, right? They've shown up to hear your talk. Uh, so there, there must be some interest there. Uh, so just build on that. Um, I also like to get there a little early and just kind of scope out the room. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, what I really like to do is if I can get there early enough where I can talk to some people that are showing up, kind of touch base with them, say, hey, you know, good to meet you. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, tell me about yourself. And you kind of make friends uh, with some people there in the room, and then it won't feel like you're just there talking to strangers. Uh, you'll feel like you already know some people. Uh, th those are good. I also like to have uh, just my thing is coffee. <laughs> the book tells you to uh, not to bring, uh, not to do, overdo it with the caffeine. You might come across as jittery, I guess, or too nervous or whatever. Uh, but I find a nice warm beverage kind of steadies me. Uh, you don't want to do the ice cold beverage because that might make your teeth start chattering. Uh, for some reason, too, and I, this probably has more to do with nervousness, 
Uh, but it seemed like every time I give a presentation, the room was like uh, it's 30 degrees, it feels like. And you, even with a suit and all this on, you, you're still kind of cold. Uh, so really having that warm beverage uh, helps me out. Uh, some other things they talked about, uh, just taking a few steadying breaths is helpful. Uh, I like to think about the rewards that might come from giving a good presentation and kind of keep that in mind, something you're working towards, uh, or just uh, something pleasant. You know, you <laughs> uh, if I, it's kind of weird, but I might, if I'm at a conference a little nervous, I might think, well, after this presentation, I'm going to go out and we're going to have a nice steak dinner somewhere. You know, something I really enjoy. And I'll just take a second or two to think about <laughs> that steak dinner and how, how much I'm looking forward to that. And that will uh, help. Uh, with this nervousness and, and fear a little bit. And so those are just some things that I do personally. Uh, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts, your tips, what works for you. Oh, <laughs> I guess I should add that there, practicing. Uh, this will make a probably bigger difference than anything else. And uh, what way I like to practice is to open up the PowerPoint that I'm actually going to give and I turn on a little timer, use my watch, uh, just some way to kind of gauge the time. And I actually sit there and pretend like I'm actually giving the presentation. I will give it exactly as though somebody were there. <laughs> somebody came across, just watched me doing this, they'd probably think I was crazy. Uh, but I'm practicing uh, for that. And even that morning, I might be in the shower uh, going over some of the lines, right? Trying out some of the jokes. <laughs> Uh, and again, people might say, oh, you're talking to yourself or, or something. Who cares uh, what they think? You know, the point is I'm practicing for that presentation. Uh, so by the time I'm up there giving it, I just feel almost like I'm uh, going through a, a very comfortable routine, uh, not having to struggle to try to uh, remember what goes where or how this is supposed to sound. And, you know, uh, I have to say, I think it makes a big difference. I usually get some uh, compliments on my presentations. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that uh, I practiced it a couple of times. Uh, so I highly encourage you to do that too. All right, <laughs> uh, here's some stuff. <laughs> look at that, look at that. <laughs> well, that guy definitely looks like he is scared. Uh, so dealing with fear, I think I've already covered some of this stuff. I, I talked about the caffeine levels. Uh, again, sometimes you're a little nervous. I'll give you a, a common scenario at the conferences I've been to, you, you got this table and you got say three or four speakers there. Maybe you're the third speaker, but you have to wait for these. You have, so you have to wait for these other two to get done with theirs. And the whole time you're there, you're, you, you know, you know, people are watching you. You're kind of anxious. You're anticipating your talk. And maybe you went and got that giant big gulp coffee. <laughs> Probably what's going to happen is you're going to have to go to the bathroom before it's your time to talk. Uh, so limit the, you know, just a couple of sips. <laughs> That's what you want to go for, not uh, chugging this huge uh, soda or coffee or whatever it is. So uh, be careful with that. Uh, alcohol, I don't know who in the world would think that's a good idea, but my, <laughs> you don't want to be uh, drunk up there. Uh, that should just go without saying. I mean, crying out loud. Uh, Relabeling your nerves. Now, this was interesting. So they said if you feel yourself getting nervous, you're breathing, your heart's, you know, going out of control. Uh, instead of saying, thinking to yourself, wow, I'm really nervous, I'm really scared. Uh, tell yourself, no, this is the adrenaline kicking in. Uh, cook, uh, adrenaline kicking in. I'm energized, right? <laughs> I'm excited to be here. <laughs> you maybe translate it into that. Say, oh, you know, I'm so glad you, you folks are here. Can't wait to tell you about my... Uh, my book proposal, you know, so you can make that nervousness come across as energy. I mean, that's that's really brilliant there. I love this. I'm really <laughs> excited to try that technique uh, next time I'm nervous about something. But uh, again, really the key to this is the more you practice, uh, the better prepared you are. A lot of this nervousness will go away. And I usually find that the very hardest time is right before it's my turn to speak. All right. So <laughs> Usually that last couple of minutes uh, is usually when I'm really nervous. But as soon as that's over and I'm up there actually talking and you're looking around and you see people, people aren't, you know, people are interested in what you have to say and everybody just kind of relaxes. 
if you have a little bit of humor at the beginning and have people chuckle a little bit, it just, all that tension goes away quickly. Uh, contracting the muscles, then relaxing them. So this is almost like a, uh, you know, like yoga type stuff here, right? You're, uh, maybe stretch a little bit, <laughs> feet and calves, shoulders, arms, hands. Uh, sometimes I will just, uh, you know, before the talk, just go walk around the uh, the hallways a little bit, just to kind of get a little exercise, get the, <laughs> the uh, blood pumping, uh, anything that would help to relax. Uh, taking a few deep breaths uh, from the diaphragm. Uh, so you might find that before your presentation, you're... <laughs> You know, you're breathing heavy, uh, you're <laughs> rapidly, and so sometimes just slowing down and, you know, taking that big breath, uh, really feeling that, uh, your lungs, letting it out slow. Uh, do this a couple times, and uh, it's, uh, to me, it's just like, uh, if you really do a nice breathing, breathing exercise, it's, it's just as relaxing as a, a shot of tequila, really. Uh, looking at the audience before speaking, now, this can help too, right? So you're looking out there, you see they're just humans. <laughs> you know, they, they, they're here. They want to hear what I have to say. Now, that can be reassuring. Sometimes we have this imagined audience in our heads of people that are really critical and they're there to tear us apart. Uh, but that's, that's probably not the case, right? So if you just look out there and you see the people, uh, they're probably smiling. Uh, they're probably looking forward to your presentation. Uh, so again, build on that. Uh, focus on what it is you're communicating, not your feelings about it, or, or not the way you're feeling. Uh, this can be really helpful too. And, you know, if you, again, have practiced well and prepared well, then you have information there uh, that you should focus on. Uh, let's see, use energy in your gestures, your mobility. Uh, again, another good reason not to be sitting down. <laughs> you don't want to get too relaxed. Um, up up there, right? If you're walking a little bit, making some... Now, you don't want to be marching around the room like some kind of uh, <laughs> robot or something, right? Uh, just You don't want to stay frozen in the sand spot the whole time either, I think. Just kind of moving around a little bit and work out some of that energy. Uh, really, really helpful. Now, I like to... When I give a... When I'm teaching and I have maybe the... Maybe the... Let's see, the screen is over here. My podium is here. Uh, what I like to do is just kind of walk out from under that, uh, go over here, point to some stuff on the slide, and go back to go to the next slide. And some people might say, well, you know, why don't you just have a clicker so you can just click and not have to keep going back there. But uh, but I find that this little bit of exercise, believe it or not, kind of makes me less nervous. Right? I, just, uh, I don't think so much about um, being nervous. I feel more like, <laughs> okay, now I need to go over here, I click the button, come back over here. And as long as you're not going back and forth again like a robot, uh, that can, everybody seems to be fine with that. Uh, using eye contact, uh, making eye contact with individuals in the audience. Uh, they say, but even before you start speaking, you can do this. And then they give you this advice about a five seconds, which that sounds about right to me. Uh, you don't want to just stare at somebody. I mean, that, that'd probably just freak them out. Uh, making your voice easy to listen to. Again, a good way to do this is just to record yourself and, and focus on slowing down, uh, maybe deepening your voice if you can, uh, maybe trying to minimize any sort of uh, nervous tics you might have. Or I notice a lot of times when people get nervous, they'll start saying, like. It was like, and it's like, and it's like, you know, so they might be doing that over and over and over again to the point where it's really distracting. They probably don't even realize they're doing that. Uh, so again, recording yourself. Uh, and if you say, oh, I'm saying that, saying, saying like too much. Uh, once you're aware of that, you can start to work on it. And don't expect perfection. Uh, you'll never just give a speech exactly 100% the way you wanted or you planned. And so don't beat yourself up too much about little stuff. And most people won't even notice it anyway, right? I mean, the point here is just to try to improve it, uh, to try to minimize the uh, the stuff that's a real bad distraction. But um, I think if Pete, I think if you put a reasonable amount of effort into this stuff, and it'll pay off big time. Uh, let's see, finding and using your 
your optimum pitch. So again, are you? Some people have a more bassy voice. Some people are more on the high register, just kind of like singing, really, right? You have the soprano singers, ten, tenure, <laughs> tenor, <laughs> tenure, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, various kinds of uh, voices for singing. It's it's a lot like public speaking. And if you, what I encourage you to do again with the recorder, try a couple different things out. You know, maybe you might try out that a, a lower pitch and find you really enjoy that, works well, uh, or you might not like it. Talking loudly enough so entire audience can hear. This is one of the big ones. And again, a lot of people get nervous, so they, they're really quiet because they really don't want people to be able to hear them because, oh my God, if they hear what I'm saying, they might be able to criticize me. Uh, banish that kind of thought. Uh, what I like to do, again, in, the, in a big room, you, you look at these people in the back and you make sure that you're aware of them. And sometimes I'll even ask a couple times at the beginning, hey, hey, can you hear me back there? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Am I loud enough? And they, they probably say, whoa, you're way too loud, man. <laughs> Quite, we get it. You, know, we, you don't have to shout at us. Uh, but how would I know that? Right, so better to be too loud, I guess, than, than people not to be able to hear you. Uh, varying the volume. So sometimes you want to be really, really quiet. So that when you get louder, <laughs> uh, you, it gets your attention, right? Uh, pitch again, you don't want to be uh, a high pitch, almost kind of a squealing type of pitch all the time. Uh, nor do you want to be sounding like uh, some kind of villain from a, a horror film either. Uh, speed. Basically, all of these, it's the same idea that really what they're trying to say here is avoid a monotone or the monotone. So that, again, that robotic, uh, let me just do one here for you. So imagine that this was the way I was talking the whole time. Make voice easy to listen to. Find and use your optimum pitch. Talk loudly enough so entire audience can hear. Vary volume, pitch, and speak. Uh, so you hear how boring that is. Uh, and I'm not, again, not trying to, uh, <laughs> brag on myself here like I'm some kind of great speaker or anything uh, I'm just saying if you do make a little effort to vary the volume sometimes you're quiet sometimes you're a little louder uh, sometimes you're higher pitched sometimes you're low <laughs> okay, it just makes it more interesting to listen to right uh, this is my big one and it's sometimes it's hard, you know, if it's been a long day and you got a, you know, class five o'clock and you're just tired, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, part of being a professional is being able to sound energetic and enthusiastic. So I'm always getting on to students about this. Uh, they'll come into class and I'll say, hey, how's everybody doing? And somebody will say, oh, I'm really tired. Oh, God, I'm so tired. And... Uh, I say, well, look, you know, when you say something like that, it, it doesn't have that professional, uh, it doesn't make you look very good in a professional way, right? It makes you look like you don't have it together, uh, that you uh, you you don't have a sensible schedule, uh, not getting enough sleep, you're probably not going to do a very good job. You know, imagine if you're paying your employees, right? Uh, and somebody's always tired. Well, you probably think, that, well, that person's probably not going to do a very good performance today. Uh I'm not going to get my money's worth out of this employee today. Or the person doesn't even really value the job, right? They're, they're complaining. They, they don't even sound like they're uh, enthusiastic about their own uh, proposal, their own speech, or the, or the lecture they're giving today, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so this is a good example here uh, where, yeah, yeah, maybe you don't feel really energized. Uh, maybe it's not the most exciting topic in the world but try, you know, put some effort in to at least sound <laughs> energized. <laughs> and a lot of the times, uh, when you fake it, you make it. It's kind of weird how that works, but uh, sometimes it's going to actually, uh, you'll even convince yourself uh, that it's exciting. Enunciate, uh, say all the sounds in each word. This is probably the hardest thing for somebody that's not uh, professionally trained uh, to be able to do and actors professional speakers they make it look easy or i guess i should say they make it sound easy 
But have you ever wondered why uh, when you listen to a professional speaker or an actor, you can usually figure out exactly every word they're saying? Now, they don't, again, they don't sound like a school teacher carefully enunciating each word. Uh, they don't do it like that, uh, but they do in a more subtle way. And this is, again, why they get paid the, the big money. <laughs> uh, enunciate in such a way that even if you're way in the back, you know, go to a stage performance in a theater. And even if you're way here in the back, you'll be able to hear every word uh, that that actor is saying. And it's really, you know, you have to admire that. So obviously not everybody in the class is going to run out and be a, a professional actor. Again, not the point. The point is just to be aware of this. And if you can put a little more effort into enunciating than you normally do, uh, that's probably uh, going to be good enough. You'll be a lot better than if you didn't pay attention to that. Some other factors, uh, standing and gesturing. Uh, so placing the feet apart. For good balance, flexing the knees. You don't want to be up there, uh, knees locked. Uh, walk if you want to. <laughs> you can walk right outside the room. Uh, no. Uh, move purposefully. Try to avoid this pacing. Sometimes people get nervous and they're kind of going back and around. and uh, It just doesn't look good. Uh, stand still for a formal talk or if you're on camera. Now, uh, most of the time, if there's a camera crew there, I would think they could keep up with you. But <laughs> I guess if it's just a fixed cam, obviously you're going to go off camera if you walk over here somewhere. Uh, so that could be a consideration. Uh, one of the things I notice uh, more than anything is a tendency to start swaying. You know, people will grab a hold of the podium or the table there and they'll kind of sway back and forth, almost like they're in a rocking chair. Uh, so try to avoid doing something like that. Uh, don't <laughs> block the screen showing your visuals. Oh. Uh, I guess that if you're facing the audience the whole time, you might want to you know, peek back there every now and then and see where your, your uh, screen is. Make sure you're not standing in front of it. Uh, big, confident gestures. Uh, so that guy, remember that guy had his whole arm out? Uh, that looks pretty good. Um, you probably wouldn't want to be rubbing your hands, grinding on your uh, fingers. That probably wouldn't look too good. Uh, arms locked uh, probably wouldn't look good. Uh, basically, you just don't want your gestures to, to make you look nervous. right? But they should be using those to make you look uh, energized right? and enthusiastic. Uh, I always think, though, with those gestures, uh, if you're putting too much thought into it, if you get a little too self-conscious about it, you're probably just going to end up looking silly. Uh, so just, you know what, if you don't normally make those kind of movements, I'd probably avoid it unless you've pr practiced it in front of a mirror and you feel, uh, you know, it's going to look good. Uh, let's see, notes. We've already covered this. That's about the note cards. Uh, <laughs> hold notes high so head doesn't bob. All right, and then on to the questions. So as a teacher, you'll often get questions at the end, sometimes during the, the middle somewhere. But if you're giving a business presentation, you'll probably get some questions too. And sometimes the questions are just friendly, people asking for information, but uh, sometimes it could be somebody trying to poke a hole in your uh, presentation, right? Uh, so the best advice is to anticipate the questions. So look, again, look over the notes, think about your audience, Ask yourself, what, what might they ask about? Uh, you don't want to be caught flat-footed and, and not know the answer to something that's really obvious. Uh, tell the audience early how you'll handle the questions. So uh, what I like to do, actually, I don't know if I've ever had to do this. <laughs> Usually the, it's kind of set up uh, already like this, but uh, I guess if I was just the first speaker and it wasn't, I wasn't introduced, uh, I might say, oh, I am so and so. Look, um, I'll take your questions at the end of the talk. Or I might say, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, just raise your hand. I'll be happy to take those questions. Uh, I guess the key is that they know that. So if you want to handle the questions at the end and you don't tell them that, then somebody might feel offended, like, well, he's not paying attention. I got my hand up. He's just ignoring it and get mad. Now this one was interesting. So 
Uh, they say, don't nod to show you understand the question. I thought about that for a while. Like, what, what do they mean there? And I'm thinking that, you know, depending on what the question is, if you're nodding, it might be saying you agree, you know, with what they're asserting in that question, right? So if they said, well, why are your, why is your company's products so terrible? <laughs> and you're nodding, kind of seems like, yeah, they are terrible, aren't they? <laughs> so uh, I never really thought about that before. Uh, so yeah, I would agree. I uh, don't nod unless you really want to. Uh, you know, nod signals agreement, right? So unless you really do agree with what they're saying, you probably don't want to be nodding. Uh, look directly at the questioner. And then, you know, this is as they're asking the question, right? Uh, but then you want to come back to that audience uh, when you answer it. And I've gone to lots of uh, conventions. And one of the things, you might have a celebrity up there who might actually be a professional actor. And so I really pay attention uh, to this process because it's something i always trying to learn more about myself right how do they handle these questions and i notice what they'll do they'll have a couple of microphones set up in the room and you know the people will be lined up there to ask their question and uh, when they're asking it the celebrity or the star will be looking at them they'll probably joke around a little bit with them uh, maybe ask them if they say their name they'll say oh hi you know hi matt <laughs> good, to, good to meet you what's your question uh, so then they'll after they hear the question, uh, they might actually repeat it if the person wasn't really articulate about it, uh, or maybe their microphone microphone wasn't working properly or something. Uh, but they'll always, as soon as they've heard from that person, they'll go back and they'll face the broader audience and they'll bring everybody into it. So it's not like a little private discussion with this person asking the question, but it's a, a topic now that's being discussed with that whole room. You know, it's, it's really effective, and I don't know how much just me telling you about it will help. Uh, so just go to a convention, a conference, and pay attention to this process, and I think you'll learn more that way. <laughs> a couple other points. Yeah, that's a lot of microphones. Uh, don't say that's a good question unless you say it every time. So I guess the idea there is if you... You know, if uh, Sean asks a question, ah, oh, Sean, that's a good question, Sean. And then Melissa asks a question, but I don't say anything. Maybe she thinks, well, I guess my question wasn't a good one. Uh, you know, I don't know if I necessarily agree with this. I think it's kind of, <laughs> you kind of have to be there to know if it's appropriate or not. But uh, it is something to be wary of, right? I repeat the question before you answer. Again, this is another one that would depend on the situation, right? Sometimes at a conference, uh, they don't have a microphone. Uh, so they kind of yell out the question, but maybe the whole room didn't hear it. Uh, so you would need to repeat that and just say simply, well, uh, the question is blah, blah, blah. Uh, linking the answer to the purpose and, and the points that you made. Uh, this is a good, just a good in general, right? You, you go back to your presentation. You probably wouldn't want to say, well, as I said on page, on slide three, and you clearly wasn't listening. <laughs> you know, not like that. Uh, but if you could say, yes, you know, this, this, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, that brings me back to, you know, the such and such point. Uh, I guess I just broke the rule there, right? <laughs> I said, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, rewording a hostile, hostile or a biased question. Thankfully, I don't really have to deal with this too much in my line of work. But, you know, maybe if you're up there giving a sales pitch or you're some kind of lawyer, attorney, uh, you might encounter this, right? Uh, so, again, somebody saying, why does your company have such horrible customer service? Or why, does, I guess in, somebody might ask me, why does eCloud State have such outrageous tuition? I, I don't know. Uh, so instead of just saying, well, let me tell you why they have said this outrageous tuition. If I say it like that, I'm... Uh, you know, I'm taking on that hostility, that bias. Uh, instead, I might say something like, well, um, uh, so you're asking me about uh, the tuition at St. Cloud State. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, something like that. Uh, so I try to find a way to reword it, take out that uh, tacit agreement uh, with the hostility. All right. And then lastly, some team presentations. Uh, so sometimes in this class, uh, and again, being in an online class, we want to have the opportunity uh, to do this. 
Although you might you might decide to uh, to do something on your own, right? But uh, sometimes you might have two or three speakers, and they're all giving the same presentation. Uh, so how do you manage that? Uh, so one, of course, is introduce each of those group members. Uh, pay let's see, pay close attention to other members when they present. <laughs> uh, I like this point because uh, sometimes you'll say, sometimes you'll have a group, uh, let's say a group of three people, and the first person gives their little spiel, and the second person starts talking, and this person, they jump on their cell phone, right, and start texting or something. They're not even paying attention. Again, that's just disrespectful. It gets a really bad impression. Again, if even you can't get excited about your presentation, then how can you expect that audience to care? Uh, so again, you just have to fake it sometimes. I know it's maybe you don't like this other speaker or whatever, uh, but just, <laughs> you know, look at them and try to model the behavior that you want from the audience. Uh, plan those transitions. So how are you going to move from this speaker to this speaker? Uh, you want that planned out in advance. You don't want to just suddenly stop and this person say, oh, is it my turn? <laughs> is it my turn? It doesn't look good. It looks like you didn't prepare. Uh, enforce the time limits. Uh, this can get really dicey sometimes. You know, maybe you have a 15-minute presentation. Everybody's got, you got three people, five minutes each. And this first person, uh, they're just, they get a little too comfortable up there. They're going on and on. They start bleeding into these other people's time. And these other folks are getting upset about that, quite uh, rightfully so. All right, so you need to have a system worked out. Um, if they can't keep up with their time, or you might just ask them, hey, how good are you about keeping track of the time? Uh, do you want me to nudge you a little bit or hold up a card? Um, a subtle, I'll make my phone have a little subtle beep or something uh, to let you know that your time limit's coming up. Uh, so there's different ways uh, to do it, but it's it's really, really offensive and disrespectful when you cut off, cut into somebody else's time. And I see this all the time. Uh, I've actually had situations before where I was uh, at an academic conference and, you know, again, there's two or three speakers there and we have a 50 minute slot and you might, everybody's supposed to have 15 minutes and, and this person might be cutting into like 20 minutes and eventually I'll just cut the person off myself. You know, if the moderator's not there to, uh, to do that and just say, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, hi, I really enjoyed that conversation, but <laughs> uh, we, we have uh, to stick to our time limit here, sorry. You know, hopefully that won't happen, but you know, just don't let people uh, walk all over your time either. That's not fair to you. Uh, coordinate visuals uh, for coherence. So again, with the, you don't want everybody on the team doing their own thing and you not knowing what they're planning to do until it's too late. Uh, instead, you've practiced it. Uh, you've mashed everything up. Everything looks good, works well together. Uh, that's the goal. All right, and then lastly, practice, practice, and practice. <laughs> I remember the time I, I was in marching band for a little bit in, in uh, high school. <laughs> uh, the band director, was he's always going on about this. Practice, practice, practice. And I said, well, aren't you concerned we might over-practice? <laughs> the guy was going to bust the, a blood vessel or something. He's like, over-practice. I mean, he just completely lost it. Uh, no, I, I do think there's a point where you get into kind of diminishing returns. Uh, but I definitely think uh, running through your presentation a couple times, again, time it, uh, give yourself the same time you would have, uh, see if you can get your friends to watch, uh, maybe record it, uh, go back and look at it, because you'll definitely notice yourself getting better as you give that as you give that presentation several times. Uh, so it's, it's always good advice, but <laughs> I don't know if it necessarily needs the exclamation point. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you do have questions, comments, uh, feedback, uh, I always love to hear uh, people's tips, their own strategies they use for giving presentations. Um, anyway, I will stop it here, and thank you for watching.